Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And on this week's roundtable, we've got, I love it when you call me Big Papa, Tate Litchfield. Tate, how are you? Great. Happy to be on the call. It's great. Great. We got the technician, Eric Peterson. Eric, how are you? I'm good. Happy to be here. Glad you're here. We've got almost ready to hibernate for the season, Bearland Aaron. Bearland Aaron Williams, how are you? Big roar. Doing well. Nice. Big roar. And then, of course, the Zen, the Zen master. Breathe in the mailing. Breathe out the marketing. Mike Zeno. How are you, Mike? Doing great. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, just a reminder for those of you that are not in the official Land Geek Wealth and Motivation Group, um, I would join. And I just go on Facebook, search for it. Um, every week we have a little link to it on our newsletter. But um, Mike and Scott are doing a daily little video. Uh, Mike, want to just run everybody through what you're doing? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, New Member Monday. Um, and that's when we just welcome new members in the group. We have Testimonial Tuesday. We had a great testimonial uh, today by Nick, uh, who's, I think he's still in college and he's already starting to crush the business. So that's incredible. We had the Minias last week, which they're doing phenomenal in the coaching program. Um, then we have Win Wednesday, which is kind of like, you know, small wins, big wins. You know, I think that a lot of times people get, um, you know, they look for the big stuff, but don't realize it's made up little things, right? So we celebrate the small wins. Think Tank Thursday, uh, you know, just kind of uh, any kind of inspiration. And then Friday was still in the air. I mean, uh, Boston and I, I mean, I was going to go with Let Freedom Ring Friday because I know how happy that makes Scott Todd. Uh, but uh, another one is uh, it's Freedom Friday. Another one is Feel Good Friday. So we're still, we're open to suggestions for Friday. All right, great. Well, that brings us to our last member of the round table. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com <laughs> forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, what do you want to talk about today? I think we should talk about should you ever stop mailing ever, ever. Because we keep talking about it, but then we find that people sometimes don't listen to us, or at least me. Well, if they don't listen to you, I know they're going to listen to Eric. Eric, what do you think? Is there ever a good reason to stop mailing? No, there's not. And I think early on, um, you know, in a person's land investing career, it's, it's really easy to, to feel like you should stop mailing, either because you ran out of names on your list and you're too lazy to go get more cause you're busy maybe doing other things or um, you know, maybe you feel like you spent all your money and you know, you have these subscriptions you have to pay for and this, that, and the other thing, and you just don't feel like you have the money to buy property. So why should you mail? And uh, you know, what I've learned over time is that you never stop mailing. And uh, if you run out of money, um, you know, there's multiple options to consider to, to find a way to get that money. So you could, you know, start optioning property. You could pre-sell property. Um, you could sell any notes that you might already have to generate some capital. And the list goes on. I mean, there's, there's so many options. There's absolutely no reason to stop mailing. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said. I wonder if Bearland Aaron wants to be the, the uh, voice of dissent. Any, any good reason to ever stop mailing, Bearland? You know, I will be the voice of dissent. Um, not that I don't agree with Eric completely. Um, I don't think you should stop mailing in general. Um, however, I do think sometimes there may be a good reason to stop mailing an area. You know, um, like for instance, we have a county that I just stopped mailing in, um, at least temporarily. And what I found was that my VA was not pricing the area correctly. Um, and it was to the extent that I was just wasting money um, because in this particular area that he was sending out the offers, there was no way anybody was going to 
even remotely bite on this pricing. And that was, that was maybe my fault for not instructing him well enough, or uh, maybe I did the right thing by spot checking every now and then and catching it. But however, we've stopped mailing so I can restructure the way he's pricing this area. However, with that said, I have not stopped mailing in, you know, two other counties that I'm working because that's going fine. And um, so overall, no, don't stop mailing because, you know, it takes a long time to ramp up that deal flow again. So by the time you stop and, you know, you sell a couple properties and you don't have any, you don't have any coming in, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of trouble. So if you're going to stop anywhere, you, you can't have all of it stop. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I do agree that if your county is not get, you know, bringing you deals, that you do need to reevaluate either A, your pricing, or B, the county, right? Um, Zen Master, what do you think? I would say that um, mailing uh, in your business is the equivalent of breathing in your life. So, like, if you're going to, how long can you hold your breath and live? How long can you stop mailing and keep your business rolling? I mean, really, that I mean, there are other ways to get deals. There are some people love buying wholesale now, but you can't buy land cheaper than you can mail for it, right? So, no, I don't think you should ever stop mailing. You know, I think that what you should actually look to do is execute higher and higher volume of mailings. And because what we do is we uh, not only do we do a land investing, our, our micro niche that we do better than anybody else is we don't do it. We build systems, automation, and delegation, and that's because you scale it. So. You should actually start to ramp it up uh, at certain levels and still work the same amount of time or less. So no, never stop mailing in my opinion. Um, never. Yeah. I mean, speaking of, you know, big lungs that somebody who could really probably hold their breath longer than any of us is, you know, the professional cycler, Tate Litchfield. So well, I, Tate, I mean, would you, would you ever, is there ever a good reason to stop mailing? No. I mean, honestly, if you stop ma mailing, it kind of sets the precedent for the, the attitude and approach that you're going to attack this business with, right? Is this a hobby or is this something you're taking seriously? If this is going to be another you know, stream of revenue for your family and for, your, for yourself, then no, you've got to stay on top of the thing that brings you new inventory. And like Mike said, there's always other ways to get deals and there's always ways to get rid of these extra deals, right? If you have more accepted offers than you can handle, that's a great problem. Go ahead and close them and move them on to someone else. Clear out some of your old inventory. Flip it to Mark. Flip it to Scott. Flip it to me. We're always interested. But, you know, don't ever pass up on a deal or stop mailing to an area because you feel like you've already got enough there. I, I see it time and time again in coaching, right? People will have five, six properties in inventory, and they'll think, all right, in the past, I've only sold one property a month. Well, they'll get their marketing system in place, and all of a sudden, they'll go from selling one property a month to four in a week. And now they're telling me, Tate, I've got a huge problem. I don't have any inventory. What do I do now? It's better to have too much than not enough, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Scott Todd, is there ever a good reason to stop mailing? I would say absolutely not. Never. Because here's what happened. Like, there, it's such a mental thing that happens. It's, it's crazy. Like, I agree with Bearland. If you're not getting results, stop. But that said, you need to be, you need to be showing up every week at a minimum with your offer letters. And, and what I mean by that is, say, look, no matter what, I'm going to mail a hundred a week, because if you mail a hundred a week that, and you're buying 1% of what you mail, that means you're going to buy a property a week. Perfect. That's perfect. Okay. But what happens is, and I got to tell you, like I did the same thing. I started, I bought five properties and I hit the brakes and I hit them hard. Like I literally just stopped mailing, like no reason to mail anymore. I don't have any money, all this other stuff. And at the time, Mark, like there wasn't, as large of a community as there is today. There wasn't a platform like Land Moto that I could go wholesale these things. Like there wasn't, I, I don't mean this to sound like pompous, but there wasn't a Scott or a Tate, me or a Tate or you that were actively looking to buy wholesale. And today 
buying wholesale, like we still mail, but I need so much inventory that there's no possible way that I could literally buy it all through mailing. And the reality is, is that if you're, if you're saying, oh, well, look, I, I don't want to wholesale this property because I want the retail. I want the big dollars. Well, then in a way, you're kind of being greedy. And in a way, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, I'm, I want to hold out for top dollar, which we all do, but at the same time, we don't because I'm going to hold out for top dollar. Then I'm going to stop mailing. I'm going to wait till I sell it. And then once you stop mailing, you know what? It takes absolute hardcore dedication to get that mailing machine back up and running because I mean, I'm going to equate it to like working out. Like the, the minute you stop working out and you skip a week of workouts, then it's like, Oh man, I got to go work out again. It's out of your routine. It's out of your system. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you haven't worked out in 52 weeks or 52 years. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, I, I agree with what everyone said, but I think what, what Eric really pointed out in the beginning was, well, let's just kind of break down the fears. Fear number one, right. Is I've got to sell now that now they have this many properties, let's create an artificial number. I've got five properties. I'm not going to buy any more until I sell them. That's the first fear, right? Is that I'm not going to be able to sell. Fear number two is I'm looking at my bank account and I feel like, well, even if I mail, which there's an expense to mailing, even though it's an investment, I don't have the capital to even buy anything there. So fear number two is I have to generate, I got to sell first before I can even, even buy any more, right? What's the third fear? Am I missing a fear? So it's going to be, I can't sell money. Success. Fear of success, right? That could be a fear. Um, well, it's more work, you know. It's You've more, work. more yeah, work. Now, yeah, now I've created more work for myself, which I guess is sort of that unconscious fear. Like, oh, now I got to hire VAs or, you know, do whatever that is or more due diligence, whatever it is. So, um, Tate, how, let's just kind of go around. How many deals have you bought that you could not sell? Um, zero. I mean, I know that sounds so cliche, but I, I've been really trying to think if I have anything in my, in, I've got a lot of stuff that's been in the inventory for some time. Maybe it was more expensive property and I'm waiting for the right person to come around, but it's not like I've spent money on anything and not recovered it. So, so sl slow selling isn't not selling. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say zero and, um, yeah, I mean, if I buy a piece of property at 10 cents on the dollar, I can sell it guaranteed. Even if it's to Scott for 20 cents on the dollar, like there's somebody out there who will buy it. And Scott's going to pay for that all day long because he's buying for 20 cents on the dollar. Why wouldn't he buy it? All right. So no, I've, I've never been stuck with anything. Right. Right. Eric Peterson, how many deals have you been stuck with? Just couldn't sell them. None. Wow. Barely Aaron, how many deals have you been stuck with? Just couldn't sell them. Well, I've got one right now. I just can't seem to sell, but it's still for sale. So, you know, it will sell. It just I mean, very slow. You just, you know, so it's zero. Just, I mean, it's zero. It's slow, right? but, if, but if you call Tate tomorrow and said, this is selling slow, I'm just going to wholesale it out to you. You make 100% on it. Do you think he would do it? No, because I bought it off. No, because I bought it from him. <laughs> no, I'm right, just kidding. So, no, I was um, like, oh, geez. No, no, <laughs> no I, yeah, your, point is, your point is completely valid. Yeah, I mean, it'll sell one way or another. Not worried about it. Um, so, yeah, zero. Zero. Zeno? None. I mean, every so often I'll get a property mark, and this is something uh, I know a lot of us do. Like, I'll buy from an area from someone, and they'll say, oh, I happen to have this parcel in – Name a place I've never heard of. Who cares? And I'll give them a hundred dollars for it, and I'll worry about it later. So there's a, maybe a couple of those hanging around that I. The reason I haven't sold is I just haven't paid any attention to them. But I picked them up for a hundred dollars, so I'm not really worried about it. Yeah, Scott. You know, it's um same same thing, Mark. Like 
they they all sell i haven't had one that hasn't sold like there's not one that's in my inventory that's never sold sometimes they they go from being sold to not sold because of a transition and i don't worry about it because it's, it's <coughs> like eventually if i ever wanted to like it's just you know i could just wholesale it or i could just get it get it down you know the cost basis down but i never have been stuck with a property and in fact, it's crazy because there was one property that I kept kicking myself, like, why'd I buy it? Why'd I buy it? Why'd I buy it? And then literally after uh, 18 months, I, I bought it. It's like a one acre property in the mountains in Tennessee in a HOA. Oh, man. And after 18 months of trying to sell it, you know, I'm thinking like, at one point, I thought I was just going to build a cabin up there on my own, but I didn't have to do that because 18 months later, some guy came along and bought it and he's been paying on it now for, uh, for a year. And I love him because I just got the HOA bill, uh, the other day for this community, which don't buy an HOA because it's only supposed to be $300 a year. But then with the special assessments for the roads, it's now 700 a year, not my problem anymore. Right, right. I mean, I've been doing this full time since 2001, over 5,200 deals now. I've never been, never been stuck with a piece of property. Now I have made mistakes. So my most recent mistake was in a POA in Texas, right? Um, I bought it right. But the reason I was buying it right is I didn't realize the, there were liens from the POA and there were back POA fees of about four hundred dollars, and the taxes I want to say were maybe fifty bucks. So, being a enterprising entrepreneur, I thought, well, let's just let it go for taxes. So I made about seven grand on that deal on the overage at the auction, which I'll be collecting in the next thirty days. So, even when you make a mistake, you still make money. Uh, so let's just so we can eliminate number fear fear number one. Um, if you're doing our pricing, right, which is, you know, you're going to look at the lowest comps, divide by four, have that Warren Buffett, 300% margin of safety, right? It's almost impossible to lose money on that deal. Make sure you do your due diligence correctly. You confirm the back taxes, no liens or encumbrances, and don't buy in a freaking POA or HOA. (laughs) What are you saying, Mark? It worked out for me. All I had to do was wait 18 I, months and pay. I me. know. They all work out, but I'm just saying. Time value yeah. money. Don't be I, like Scott. Don't be <laughs> like, or, or me. Treasure Lake was my worst deal because that freaking POA. All right. So that's fear number one. Fear number two. Tate Litchfield. Have you ever looked at a deal and passed because you didn't have the money, even though you locked it up 25, 30, 35 cents on the dollar? No. I mean, they, there's always ways to get it. Eric kind of outlined that. You could sell notes. You could, there's so many different ways to generate some extra money. I mean, I, I work with a guy regularly and he'll say to me, "If you know, hey, I'm buying this property. If you want it, here's the price. Send a check. I'll send him a check. He gets paid, takes that money, buys the property, deeds it to me. Right? So, I mean, there's always workarounds and you just got to get a little bit creative. So, Money is not something that should limit you, right? You have to be aware of it. And, you know, it's easy to say that when you've, you know, when I've done all these deals, but the reality is if the deal makes sense, you can find somebody who will also see the value in it and they'll be more than willing to, you know, help lend a hand. Yeah. Eric Peterson, ever had a pass on a deal? Just didn't feel like you had the capital? Um, I don't think... Not that, not that's a good deal. Like certainly I've passed on deals that, um, you know, maybe I was low on capital at the time, but it turned out that, you know, it wasn't going to be a good deal, whether it, I priced it wrong or, you know, there was an issue with the property or something like that. But I think that, um, if the deal is good, if you priced it right and you've got an accepted offer, there's just, there's so many options, um, to find the money for that deal. Um, and I get it like, you know, just starting off, it can be a little maybe overwhelming or, or more of an unknown of like, you know, how can I, how can I buy this, let's say thousand dollar property, um, when I don't have any money, but 
I know it's a good deal because it should sell for, you know, 4,000 or something. Um, and if you don't have that network, you don't know other investors in the industry. Um, yeah, that can make it a little harder, but if you put the effort in and build some relationships, um, you know, that's going to take you a long way. And that kind of ties into boot camp, which we have coming up. Um, you know, it's a great place to, to get to know other investors and, and make some connections. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't booked yet for boot camp, we still have spots. Just go to landgeek.com forward slash boot camp. I anticipate um, we will be sold out um, in, in the next week, but there's still time. Uh, Bearline Aaron, how about you? Ever had to pass on a deal because didn't have the money? Um, yeah, but kind of more like Eric said, where um, it wasn't going to be a great deal. Or, um, you know, after I did my due diligence and found out maybe the back tax level or something about the property, um, it wasn't something that I could necessarily offer to somebody else. It's like, you know, we're one of those things where if you, if you needed to do a deal, you could make, you know, pennies as far as our business is concerned on it, but it wasn't, wasn't great deal, you know, so nothing never passed on something that was like, Hey, this is, I, I'm buy it right. The property's great. You know, because even if I don't have the money, I'll just shoot out there that I've got this property who wants it, you know, and we, you know, I can make a couple bucks, they can make a couple bucks. It's that simple. Um, I've even worked on some options and stuff. So no, not, not really, not just let them go. No. Right. Zen master Mike Zeno. How about you? No, because um, you know, the network of people that I've met has allowed, you know, pretty much there's no price point probably I couldn't buy, right. If I had a great deal. And I, and I think that ties into what Eric said, um, is the boot camp is a great place to network and meet people. You find people that have a lot of capital, but maybe a little bit shy on execution. And if you're an executor, you can uh, bring something big to the table that they'll want. And the other thing is too, is you choose your price point in this business. I think that's one phenomenal part about the business is that you can literally, you said it, 25 cents on the lowest comp. So find something selling for a thousand bucks and pick it up for 250, right? Or whatever you you decide your price point. So it's not like all of a sudden, I mean, it could happen, right? You talk to somebody and, hey, I got this, but it's not like you're going to find a, all of a sudden you're going to get a $10,000 property that's a stellar deal when you mailed out on $250 offer letters, right? So you have control too, big control. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Scott Todd? Haven't been stuck with one. I think that what stops people a lot of times is that uh, kind of what Mike just said. It's sometimes it's hard to even believe that you can sometimes name your own price. Like there was an area um, in Pima County, Arizona that I, I found and I, I saw that other land investors were buying in there for like $1,000. And I felt like the right price was 300. Like it, I just felt that way uh, based on what I was seeing. And I just mailed out some offers for 250 just to see if I had any takers. And I bought five properties at $250 a pop, okay? And then I turned, I turned around and I bundled all five of them together and sold them as a wholesale deal for five thousand dollar profit. So I invested twelve fifty, uh, not not five thousand dollar profit. Sorry, I invested twelve fifty, sold them for a thousand each. So I ended up uh, making what thirty eight hundred dollars profit. And if you're just starting out, like the reality is, is that. You can, even if you mail high, you can continue to negotiate back down. There's great stories out there, people who have done that, negotiate back down. And then next thing you know, go, go find someone who needs wholesale land. You sell it, put the money in the bank. Rinse yeah, Scott, remember, remember in flight school, Jennifer? Yeah. Uh, she's like, I, she just goes to sell it. Like, well, I, I don't have the money. And she just like negoti kept negotiating and down. She, she, she locked it up at a, at a great price. She initially offered 2700 Then she dropped it down to 1700 Then she told the guy, she's like, hey, I made a mistake. I don't even have $1,700. He's like, okay, well, how much do you have? She's like, I have 700 And he's like, okay, I guess we're going to do it for 700 So, look, people, pe people want to get rid of this stuff. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. I remember Paul Mendel 
he, he only had money for mailing. So he, he locks up the property in upstate New York and uh, tells the seller, hey, it's going to take 90 days to do due diligence. Doesn't even, doesn't even option it. And the seller's like, okay, well, it doesn't take 90 days to do due diligence. Just send out neighbor letters. Neighbor buys it for like 10 grand or something and does a dual closing and he makes himself, you know, I forgot how much he made. And, and, no. But remember, Mark, like if the neighbor wouldn't buy it, he would never call them back either. Remember that? Like if the neighbor didn't buy, then he wouldn't even call the, the seller back and say, look, it's not going to work out. He just basically ghosted them. Gone. He was gone. And, uh, you know, he only dealt with the deals in which the neighbor would buy the property next door. That's the only thing he would ever buy. Yeah. It worked. All right. Well, I thought this was a really great roundtable podcast. I just want to remind all the listeners that the only way we're going to get the Zen master to come out of the firehouse is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review to support at the We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. Today's podcast is sponsored by flight school. Learn how to start 2019 Accelerate your success with the Sherpa of all Sherpas, Scott Todd, and learn more. Just go to landgeek.com forward slash training, schedule a call with the Zen Master, Mike Zeno, or the Nightcap Meister, Scott Bossman, to learn more. All right. Tip of the week. Mike Zeno, what do you got? I'm, gonna, I'm coming toward the end of the year, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a quote out there. Scott, you don't have to go dark on the screen. I'll, I'll get through this. It's short. <clears throat> this actually ties in. Remember before we were talking about, we had this talk on the round table about uh, if, you know, uh, you know, this moment to moment, you know, uh, you know, this awareness ruined the idea of having a plan, you know, this idea of like planning your life out, but being spontaneous. So I thought this quote really ties that all in. So it says living in the moment is not the absence of vision. It's having the vision to know what you focus on today, create your tomorrow. So I'll say it one more time. Living in the moment is not the absence of vision. It's having the vision to know that what you focus on today creates your tomorrow. So I think that's great. Like one thing I've been doing lately, I love this uh, little weekly action plan. So I get this all filled out, right? But then I can focus on these tasks. I haven't prioritized throughout the week. And then I can have my moment to moment awareness on that task and not overwhelmed. Like, you know, that dichotomy of like having a plan, but being spontaneous, like how do you put the two together? And uh, I think that's one way. So I thought that would tie into what we've talked about uh, recently. I, I love it. I mean, I was, I was feeling anxious uh, this morning about something with geek pay and I just took a deep breath and I'm like, what problem do I have at this moment? I'm like, Oh wait, I don't really have a problem at this moment. It's just, I'm making it up in my head. Like when I get to the computer, I'll write down my problem and I'll deal with the problem that moment. Right. But in that moment, there is no problem. It's crazy. Isn't it? How the day can truly be ruined by your own, expectations that you create and then you don't meet them. And then you end of the day, you feel stressed, anxiety, but you created the whole thing. You could just rework that from the beginning, right? It's, it's crazy powerful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tate's like, this is so woo woo. No, I think no, Scott I actually like, like this. Look at, him. Look at Scott. He's like, Whoa. stress is real. He loves it. Listen, man, you keep, <laughs> I, I do, I do believe, I, I, I do believe in what you said, Mike. Like I do, I do think that that's right because I think that things become a self-fulfilling prophecy a lot of times and you, we put more pressure on ourselves. We, uh, we internalize things. We put greater value on like the, the, the silly stuff and uh, not enough value on the important stuff. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. So um, when this podcast goes out, because we, we, we record a week early, it will be one of the best days, if not the best day of the year, Christmas. What a wonderful Christmas gift. Under the tree, bring out your podcatcher, whatever it is, how you listen to your podcasts, and listen to the roundtable. It's the gift that keeps on giving. So um, Merry Christmas to everyone and uh, really, really excited to hopefully grant everyone 
the wonderful gift of passive income, which equals freedom, which leads us to, are we ready to do it, guys? Let's go. One, one two, three. Let freedom ring. Look, that's the last one for the year, too. Isn't that was it? the best one ever. That, I think that is the last one for the year. Wow. Let's stop. Like, oh, we did. Yeah. Wow. You got to call it right then. Call it. That's it. We're done. For, so for 2019, I actually want to talk to you about this, Eric. Um, we got to like update the podcast, like update the logo a little bit, like change things up. We're going to do like a new intro, outro. Um, you know, just. You know what? Different. Mark, you know, when they start new TV series, everybody always looks a little different. We could all change up our look for the next podcast. We got to, it's like, you know, they always get a little bit more fit because they know the show got popular. They exercise some. We, maybe they got a new haircut. We all got to come back looking different next year, next season. Next season. Well, I'll tell you what. If you're not going to boot camp in San Antonio, Scott Todd's going to wear a muscle shirt. He's going to be all abbed out from uh, his workouts. It's, it's He's busting quite, out his wedding soup. And quite impressive. Pre- yeah. His tux. Yeah. I mean, Scott, how, how, many, how many cows are you burning on a, per workout now? Uh, nah, about like four. four it depends on the day. Four to 500 a day on, on the – the Peloton and uh, eating right. And I can tell you like the scale, the scale hasn't necessarily moved in the last week, but man, oh man, my pants and my shirts and all my clothes are fitting. They're loose. I feel good. I got the blood flowing through me, Mark. I mean, it's, listen, I got to tell you something like it was um, today. It's like, it's a beautiful day here. It's like 65, 68. It, okay. Like Mike's like, what are you talking about? But listen, he's going to think I'm nutty when I say this, but in Florida, 65, 68, it, it is sweater weather. Okay. Like I know it sounds weak. I know it is, or at least a long sleeve shirt. And man, I'm like going outside. I'm like in short sleeve shirts. I'm thinking like, man, maybe all of the activity is making me hotter, warmer. Like I'm, I'm like feeling like great. Yeah. Fuck, I got something here for you. I got to tell you. <laughs> this is what 60 it was like 68 12, below well, Scott said the calories. 12 weird things you didn't know helped you burn calories you ready for this quick list okay sure brushing your teeth chewing cooking driving eating spicy food fidgeting kissing laughing meditating pushing a shopping cart and sleeping and then walking on different surfaces I don't need a Peloton. I'm just going to embrace those 12 things. Okay. You do it. Wow. <laughs> Tell me what, what, are you, what, what list are you reading from? Is this like a Ripley's Believe It or Not? I just looked it up online because Scott's if you want to calorie. How, how, how do you burn calories meditating? You're just sitting there breathing. So basically living, you're burning yeah, calories. I was going to say, doesn't that number mean 13, like just living. existing? Just existing? Existing. Number 13, Dave. Being awake? Yeah. Sleeping. Doing anything burns calories. Yeah. I mean, any sort of movement Why? is. Speaking of which, is Eric, have you been swaying the whole time? What do you call that again? Yeah, I'm on my board. He's really got balance. Yeah, you really do. Does it feel good? Yeah, I love it. I stand on it most of the day. <laughs> I'm too lazy for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks so much. And uh, again, hope the the listeners are enjoying this bonus content. We'll see everyone next. Is it next year? Next year. Next year. It's crazy. Is it me or this year fly by? Happy New Year. Bye. It's crazy. All right, fellas. See you later. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.